great that I preached and I, my voice needs a rest and I'm trying to finish this dissertation. So I'm so grateful. Um, everybody needs a pool in their lives, right? Everybody needs a pool. Everybody needs a pool. And so I'm so grateful to have uh, Larry Poole here at this church. If you don't know, Poole and I met when, when I first organized the church, and he was just as kind to me then um, as he is kind and loving to me today. So he is a signature in my life and our family's life. And so give him your signature, give him your love, the one and only Larry Poole. I told him, I told him this morning, I said, you look like a good old Baptist preacher this morning. He said, I've just dressed up for you. I've dressed up for you this morning. All right. Thank you, Brother Mac. Yeah, Brother Mac told me I look like an old Baptist preacher, uh, which I am. Uh, and uh, it reminded me that uh, it was actually 59 years ago this month that I preached in view of a call at a little church called Harmony Odell outside of Huntington, Texas. And if you don't know where that is, you ask Brother Ricky. But anyway, um, uh, it, it has been a, a blessing uh, to be here, to be a part of one church, and I am thankful for Brother Mac giving me the uh, opportunity to be able to, to preach and to share in these series of sermons on Jesus, the ultimate lemonade maker. And over the next few weeks, uh, Brother Roberson will also be bringing the word, and I'm excited and looking forward to that. Uh, but this morning, we are looking at the Gospel of John, chapter 2, and we are looking at Jesus, the ultimate lemonade maker, and the power over markets. The gospel records two instances in which Jesus went into the temple and drove out those who were corrupting it. The one here in John, the second chapter, is at the beginning of his ministry. The first year of his ministry, he had just performed that miracle at the marriage feast at Cana. And then he goes up to Jerusalem for the Passover. The other instance occurs in the third year of his ministry as he was returning to Jerusalem during that fateful time and days at the end of his life here on earth. But in John, the second chapter, in verse 13 and 14, we find that now the Passover of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing their business. The Passover was arguably the most important event in the Jewish calendar. It was established in the book of Exodus in the 12th chapter when God created the Passover when the angel of death was going to pass over the land of Egypt and all the firstborn males, animals and humans were going to die unless they had the blood of a lamb on the door of their building. And God said in Exodus, the 12th chapter, This day shall be to you a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. All Jewish males, 12 and older, were required to go to the temple to observe Passover. And it was there that they would commemorate and celebrate the sacrifice that was made that protected them from the angel of death. In the same way, we gather every Sunday for a purpose. And I know some people come because we got great preaching. <coughs> Today, 
you're a visitor today is an exception. Because <laughs> we got great preaching. We got great music. We got great fellowship. I come for all those reasons. I come for the preaching. I come for the fellowship. I come for the music. But that's not really why I'm here. And I hope it's really why you're not here. I'm here for the purpose of telling the world that on the first day of the week, my Jesus bodily rose from the grave. <clears throat> we are here not for Brother Mac and I love him and I've loved him for years we're here for Jesus there's a purpose for our gathering here just as there was a purpose to the Passover but Jesus discovered <clears throat> there was a problem in the temple just as I think Jesus looks at the vast majority of churches in our land today that are gathered on this first day of the week and he sees a problem. The problem was that the temple had been turned into a marketplace. They were required <coughs> to offer sacrifices of a calf, sheep, a goat, a dove, a pigeon, depending on what you could afford. Now, under the Old Testament, you could bring your own animal. But by this first century temple worship, the only animals <clears throat> that the priests would approve were the ones sold there at the temple. Because the priests got a share of the money. Now in the Roman Empire, the Roman coin was the coin of the realm. And people from all over brought their Roman coins to Jerusalem. But the temple required the use of Jewish shekels. So that meant they had to change their Roman coin for Jewish shekels, hence the money changers. And the priests got a cut. They got a share. It was corrupt. The place to worship God was corrupt. The prophet Zephaniah <coughs> said, Her prophets are insolent, treacherous people. Her priests have polluted the sanctuary. They have done violence by the law. The modern American church has been corrupted by the marketplace. Now, we live in an economic system that's called capitalism, or some call it free enterprise or the market system. And there are some people that think, well, capitalism started in the Garden of Eden. It's God sanctioned, God created. No, it's not as man made. As a matter of fact, capitalism did not emerge as a true economic system until the late Middle Ages. The definitive work describing capitalism was not written until 1776. That's when Adam Smith wrote Wealth of the Nations. Capitalism, which is the heart and soul of what we have in America, is an economic system. That's all it is. It's not a moral system. There's no morality to it. As a matter of fact, it's the antithesis of that. Capitalism is based on the notion, and Adam Smith describes this in his book, that all humans operate on one premise, selfishness. We're all selfish and all greedy. You know, in that movie, Wall Street, the character Gecko says, greed is good. Greed is good. The goal is to get all you can, the more you can, amass it, build it up. And churches get caught up into that ideology. 
Jeremiah says an astonishing and horrible thing <coughs> has committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely and the priests rule by their own power and my people love to have it so. They love to hear the messages that glorify wealth and prosperity and goodness. You know, when America was settled, some of those earlier settlers were called Puritans. They came out of England. They were practitioners of Calvinist theology. And when Calvin developed his theology about God's election and choosing only a select few to go to heaven, the big question was, how do you know if you've been elected to go to heaven? How do you know if you've been chosen? And some people said, well, God will tell you. But humans are liars, and they could stand up and say, well, God told me. So I'm in, I'm in, I can be a part of the church. Some people said, well, it's how you live a moral, decent life. But people can fake that too. They can pretend to be moral and decent and honest. You know, it's like back in the old days before cars were air conditioned. You could pretend you have air conditioning by simply rolling all your windows up, driving around sweating, and tell everybody, I got air conditioning. But they said, no, we need a real foolproof answer to how you know you're in the elect. So the Calvinists came up with a solution. If you are prosperous and rich, you're going to heaven. And that evolved into what we call the Puritan work ethic. Your life is not determined about how you serve others and do for others. It's determined about how you serve self and do for yourself. If you go back to colonial America, the best places in the church were reserved for the rich. The early churches in Massachusetts were like the one described in the book of James, Brother David. When they said to the rich people, come in and sit down, and said to the poor people, y'all get in the back. Because what evolved in America was the antithesis of the Christian ethic. Because with our capitalist system, being rich is good and being poor is bad. And we became the only society in the world that equates economic status with moral status. We are the only society in the world that says poverty is a sin. And yet my gospel tells me that Jesus came to preach to the poor. To share that message to them. But in America, our churches, our religious institutions have become so corrupt and so materialistic that we support the ideas that are even enacted into law. In Texas, we have made empathy and compassion illegal. You cannot show compassion for others in the schools because that's illegal. The last thing in the world we want is inclusion. Because we want exclusion. We don't want to involve everybody else. It's there. The legislature passed a House bill this last session that made it illegal to show compassion and empathy for others who have suffered and are suffering. Just as a side, there was a controversy in the Condro Independent School District if you don't know where that is, that's between Huntsville and Houston. A teacher getting ready for school put up a welcoming poster in her classroom to show that everybody was welcome, everybody was included. Showed a little white girl holding the hands of a little black girl. A member of the school board of trustees protested and demanded that that poster be taken down because it promoted inclusion. That's the law in Texas. And every member of the legislature that voted for that law 
proclaims to be a believer and a follower of Jesus and their pastors love them and preach to them and sanction it. There's a problem in the church. There was a problem in the temple. It was corrupt. There's a problem in the church of America. It's corrupt. We've even convinced poor people to hate other poor people. You're poor not because some rich man has exploited you and abused you and used you. You're poor because some other poor person got your job that you didn't get. That's what I used to tell my classes, the plantation mentality. Why did all those poor white people Support the institution of slavery because every one of them believed that someday they were going to own a plantation. That's the mentality of the marketplace. That's the corruption, and it came into the church. Malachi proclaims the lips of the priests should keep knowledge, and people should seek the law from the mouth for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you have departed from the way. You have caused many to stumble at the law. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi. The priest in that temple had strayed from the law. They had corrupted the word. They had corrupted the message. And the vast majority of pastors in America today are in that same condition. They won't stand up and declare when an injustice exists. They won't declare when sin is permeating the land. They're afraid. You know, at the Old Testament prophets had been American pastors, we wouldn't have most of the Old Testament because they wouldn't have said anything. But when Jesus saw that, he took action. He made a whip of corns. He drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold the doves, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. You know, the Bible tells several times that Jesus got upset. A lot of American Christians are angry. They are angry at what they see as the sin in the land. Brother Mac gave me a book, and I think he did it just so I would stir up and make my blood boil. <laughs> and uh, it's a book called Woke Jesus by Lucas Miles. And it says that this idea of a woke Jesus is a heresy. The idea of a Jesus with compassion and empathy and love for others is not the Jesus that Americans want. We want a Jesus that's mean and cruel and violent against the terrible sinners. And who are the sinners? Oh, they'll tell you. Those with alternate lifestyles. Those with moral transgressions. Those that vote the wrong way. Those that don't worship a certain politician. Those are the sins that they get all bothered about. Russell Moore, the former head of the Christian Life Commission for the Southern Baptists who was forced out, is now working for Christianity Today and he's got a new book out. And he points out that most American Christians today reject the Sermon on the Mount. He tells of all the pastors he's talked to who preached on the Sermon on the Mount and, and members would come up and say, where did you get that woke ideology? Where did you get that strange perversion? And he said, well, it's the words of Jesus. And pastor after pastor said the response well, that just doesn't apply today. Even a prominent pastor in Dallas a few years ago publicly declared the Sermon on the Mount no longer applies today. 
the corruption in the church. But when you look at who Jesus got mad at, he got mad at those in the temple. The priests who allowed the corruption of the temple. He got mad at the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes. In Matthew, the 23rd chapter, he denounces the Pharisees and the scribes eight times. He didn't get angry at Zacchaeus, the tax collector. He invited him to come down from the tree so he could go to his house. He didn't get angry at the woman caught in adultery. He said, woman, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. He didn't get angry at the woman at the well who was a repeat adulteress and a sinner. He loved her and said, I am the Christ. He loved her. He loved and had compassion for the sinners. And Jesus made an announcement. You shall not make my house a house of merchandise. Churches today have become houses of merchandise. They're centers of entertainment. They want to make people feel good. They want to make people be happy. They'll do everything they can to make everybody have a good time. And they want nothing to do with those that they perceive as sinners. They don't want them in the church. They don't want them in their stores. They don't want them in their schools. They don't want them in their lives. They only want the ones they consider to be the decent, the moral, and the the, the good. We've corrupted the church. One commentator said, the church has become a museum for saints. But it ought to be a hospital for the spiritually sick. It should be a place where the hurting and the desperate find God. The modern church needs to be welcoming and not rejecting. But the modern church has become more the kingdom of man than the kingdom of God. And the Jews said to Jesus, Why do you do this? Give us a sign. Give us a sign. And Jesus said, I'm going to give you a sign. You destroy this temple and in three days I'm going to raise it up again. And oh, they looked at him and said, oh, that's not possible. You see, the temple that they worshipped in was relatively new. The temple that had been built by Solomon, the wonderful, splendid temple, had been destroyed in 586. In the restoration, Ezra had led in the rebuilding of the temple. But when a lot of people saw that, they wept that had remembrance of the old temple. Herod and Adamian wanted to sort of play political games and endure himself to the Jews, set out on a 46-year building project to build a new temple. And so the Jews said, it took 46 years to build this temple. You say that if it's destroyed, you can build it back up in three? And Jesus in his heart said, amen. 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 And John puts a parenthetical in here, and he said, you know, the disciples didn't understand, but, but when Jesus arose, then they remembered. But you see, John was being a little nice. Yes, they did remember eventually. You see, the disciples are like a lot of American Christians. They're slow learners. It just takes a while to to get the message. You know, Brother David, you know, you have that student, you got to tell them ten times before they finally get it. Jesus was going to talk throughout his ministry about what was going to happen. He came to this earth as a living sacrifice and he was going to die on the cross of Calvary. But three days later, he was going to bodily come out of that tomb. But when the disciples first heard the glorious message, they didn't believe. Here's how Mark puts it. 
when he arose early on the first day of the week, Sunday, amen, that's why we're here. He appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. And when they heard he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. But Mark says later Jesus showed up to that church meeting with those disciples. He appeared to the eleven and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Now this is just a little aside. It won't cost you any more. That first evangelist carrying the good news of the resurrected Jesus wasn't Peter, wasn't John. It was Mary, a woman. So I've got news for my Baptist brethren. A woman was the first evangelist to proclaim the gospel of the resurrected Jesus. And I invite all of them to come meet Sister Thompson and they'll find out that a woman can proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. But you know, John tells us that after that, those in Jerusalem during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man for he knew what was in man. You see, during those early years, there were fake believers, just there are fake believers now. That's the problem in the churches. The churches are filled with fake believers. And sadly, there are pulpits filled with fake believers. Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. You know, Brother Mac often talks about, he talks to people and they say, Oh, Pastor God knows what's in my heart. And the problem is that's true. And what God knows in your heart is not what you think he knows because he knows the truth. He knows what is inside of you. He knows those who have their priorities on the things of this world. Luke tells us in the 16th chapter of his gospel, the Pharisees who were lovers of money, parentheses Americans, also heard all these things and they derided him. And he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your heart. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. When Jesus told about the two men praying, one of them was a Pharisee, a lover of money, and was justified before men. And he prayed, and the Bible says he prayed to himself. Because God wasn't hearing it. And he said, oh God, I thank you I'm not like all these other people. Lord, I thank you I'm not like all these sinners. Lord, you know, I'm, I'm thankful that I, I'm not like all those people that, that, that are so horrible. I, I know you hate them. But, Lord, I'm a good guy, and I know you love me. Wow. Jesus said that went, man went down empty. But over in the corner, there was a sinful, deceit, despised publican, tax collector. He didn't look up to heaven, oh, God, I'm so, no. He looked down, and he beat on his breast. And he prayed that simple prayer, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said, that man was justified. An awful lot of people claim Jesus, but they don't follow Jesus. Claiming Jesus is easy. You don't believe that? The demons claim Jesus. Right? Right? But the Gospel of Mark tells us 
he called the people to himself with his disciples. And he said, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. <clears throat> For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? There's a popular TV show called Let's Make a Deal. So you may be familiar with that. You get this one thing and, and he said, you want to trade it in for what... He's behind door number one or door number two or door number three. Or do you want to keep it? Americans play that game. Let's make a deal. What are you going to give in exchange for your soul? Some people spend their entire lives pursuing riches, pursuing monetary gain. Some people even get active in church and they give to the church for what they can get back in return. Oh, if I give to the church, God's going to bless me with that new car. If I give to the church, God is going to fatten my 401k. You see, that's American capitalistic giving. When we give to God, we give it with no intention of reciprocity. We don't give to God saying, well, God's going to give back to me more than what I give to Him. We give because we love Jesus. And we want to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. You can give all and not necessarily get a lot in return. You know, there's a preacher down in Houston, packs a huge auditorium every week and preaches to millions all over. He's very, very popular preaching that prosperity gospel. He says, if you really give, really sacrifice, God's going to bless. And every time I see his commercial or hear him, I think, well, poor Paul couldn't be a member of his church. Because Paul said, I indeed count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Lost everything. Promising career, family, potential fortune. When Paul met Jesus on that road to Damascus, he gave all that up. He gave it all up. You know, a horrible thing has happened. There on the island of Maui a few years ago, Paradise, California, the same thing happened. Fires ravaged and wiped everything out. They lost everything. But I pray that every one of those people who lost all that they had, that through help will be able to recover and rebuild and, and recoup their loss. But more than that, I hope they have Jesus because that fire can't burn Jesus. You know, what is your priorities? What's important in your life? You know, Cherry and I like watching romantic comedies. And I know sometimes when, when we're going to movies a lot, I'd, go to, I'd be the only man in the theater with a whole bunch of women. And I'd be crying right along with them. <laughs> but one of our favorites is called Leap Year. And, and one of the actors says to the other, how can you tell what you love? <clears throat> and the question is, if there's a fire, what do you grab? And so this young woman who was engaged to a rich doctor was at a party. And she decided she's going to see, does he really love me? So she pulled the fire alarm. And people started running out. And her patrol didn't come and get hurt. Oh, you could tell he was an American. He went and got his laptop and his cell phone. Oh, those are, I can lose everything else, but Lord, don't let me lose my electronics. You know, you can lose everything you have, but if you've got Jesus, you're a winner. 
because you're not going to take that big house with you to heaven. You're not going to take that luxury car with you to heaven. Your 401K isn't going with you. You know, you, they, they don't take Wells Fargo wagons to the funeral. You're not going to take any of that. The only thing you can take from this life to the next life is Jesus. And he will never leave you and never forsake you. Those people suffered a horrible disaster in that fire. But it reminds me of three young Jewish men who were in a fire, but they had Jesus with them in the midst of that fire, and they came out of it. They came out of it. You know, Brother Mac has been preaching about making lemonade. And Jesus, the ultimate lemonade maker. And Brother Mac put in there the lemons and the country time and the sugar and the water. But that's not all he did. He stirred it up. He stirred it up. You can put the lemons in the jar. You can put the country time. You can put the sugar, and you just let it sit there, and it's not going to be lemonade. It's got to be stirred. And Jesus is the stirrer, and he stirs by the Word of God. The Word of God needs to be stirring our lives. The Word of God should not only comfort, the Word of God should convict. And I know most American churches have taken conviction out of their lexicon. But God hadn't. God hadn't. The prophet Ezekiel. And you want to find some conviction. You want to spend some time that will break your heart. Do some Ezekiel study. And the word of the Lord came to me, Ezekiel says, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat and close yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost but with force and cruelty you have ruled them. That ought to convict every pastor, every church member in this land. Isaiah says, Even to your old age I am he, and even to gray hairs I will carry you. (laughs) That means a whole lot more to me than it did 20 years ago. I have made and I will bear, and even I will carry and will deliver you. To whom will you liken me and make my equal and compare me that we should be alike? They lavish gold out of the bag and weigh silver on the scales. They hire a goldsmith and he makes a god. They prostrate themselves. Yes, they worship it. They bear it on the shoulder. They carry it and set it in its place. And it stands from its place. It shall not move. Though one cries out to it, yet it cannot answer nor save him out of his trouble. Remember this and show yourselves men. Pay attention, men. Show yourselves men. Recall to mind, O you transgressors, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. We say, oh, we don't have idols. Yes, we do. Drive through my neighborhood and you see all those houses. Those are idols. Look at the cars out there in the parking lot. For many, that's an idol. Look at your bank account. Look at your savings account. That's an idol. And not a one of them can save you. Not a one of them can can, can bring you out of trouble when you're down. You see, the American church, like that temple, needs a Jesus cleansing. Needs a Jesus cleansing. We need an old-fashioned national altar call, call to confession and repentance. 
As Russell Moore says in his new book, Losing Our Religion, an altar call for evangelical America. I grew up in an old time when they used to have legitimate altar calls. And they were calls for the members to come down and get on their knees and pray to God and confess their transgressions and seek forgiveness and commit their lives to serving Jesus Christ, not only in name but in action. We live in a land, a nation that is increasingly more pagan than it is religious and the nation that needs Jesus, the ripest mission field in the world. It's not Asia, it's not Africa. It's the United States of America. And it's not up to our pastor to go to everybody in Midlothian and share the gospel of Jesus. It's up to me and it's up to you. It's up to every one of us. You see, the church needs to stop being a house of merchandise and become the house of prayer and the light of the gospel that it was called to be. And it begins with God's people when God's people make a commitment to do the right thing. There's an old hymn. Some of you may be old enough to remember it. And it goes like this. All to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. All to Jesus I surrender. Humbly at His feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me, Jesus. Take me now. All to Jesus I surrender. Make me Savior, holy love thine. Let me feel the Holy Spirit. Truly know that thou art mine. All to Jesus I surrender. Lord, I give myself to thee. Fill me with thy love and power. Let thy blessings fall on me. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. You know, we are too often like those in Malachi. When it comes to giving to God, we give Him our leftovers. Malachi said, when you give to God, you don't give the finest, you give the blind and the lame. And a lot of Christians are that way. We give God our leftover money. We give God our leftover time. We think we're really sacrificing that, you know, I I was in church two hours. Lord, what a sacrifice. I got to get home and watch that three and a half hour football game. We need to become committed. You see, that cleansing of the church begins with me and it begins with you. Jesus said, you shall not make my house a house of merchandise. My house is a house of prayer. I pray that each and every one of you will make that commitment. I don't know what your priority is in your life. But you need Jesus. If you've never put your faith and trust in Him, you need Jesus. Oh, you may have proclaimed His name. You may have been baptized. I remember when when I was little, I was about seven years old. I got baptized in a Baptist church. I got baptized for a very good reason. My brother did. Anything my older brother did, I did. But several years later, Jesus got a hold of me and convicted me and sitting right there in the pew, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And then I went down that aisle and shook Dr. Henderson's hand to let him know that I have finally found Jesus. My name was on the church roll. My mother made sure we were in church 
every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, every revival meeting. I mean, I didn't have any choice. Even when she was a single mother and we had to ride that streetcar because you didn't have a car, we were going to be in church. Right? But being in church, having a godly mother did not get me Jesus. I'm not going to heaven because of my mother. I'm not going to heaven because of my godly grandmother and grandfather. I'm going to heaven because of Jesus. And if you don't have Jesus, you need Jesus. You can have your name on the church roll. You can get dunked 72 times. You know, you can get all over the place. I don't care. But until you've been born again. And that's not an option. Jesus didn't say to Nicodemus, well, you know, you ought to get born again. You know, you ought to think about being born again. He said, you must be born again. And the cleansing of the church in America begins when church members get born again. It's been a blessing. Brother Mac. Turn the service over to Brother Mac. Thank you for bidding up this morning.